Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fourth season, we're looking at Kenneth Branagh's 2011 film, Thor. I'm Matthew Fox from TheEthicalPanda.com. And I'm Andy Nelson from The Next Real Film Podcast. Today, we're talking about Minute 11, which begins with the Einherjar guards walking towards the casket and ends with some frost giants grabbing it. Joining us on the show today is Ashley Coffin. Ashley's been a, a longtime friend and uh, podcasting partner of mine. She's the one of the co-hosts of the MCU podcast and is just going to be found all over the Stranded Panda Podcast Network. Ashley, so good to have you with us today. Thanks for having me. This is this is exciting. I was very excited when you brought this to me because it's such an interesting idea. Awesome. Well, I know you're a big fan of Thor. I know I've loved hearing all the stuff you have to say about Thor and Loki and, you know, all sorts of stuff about them. And so I think we're really excited to have you be able to kind of dive deep on some stuff. And so, you know, we gave you some different options. Why did you pick these five specific minutes? Well, you know how I feel about Loki. <laughs> <laughs> and just being so immersed in the show over the last couple of weeks, it was like fun to go back to like the beginning of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think and that's going to be a really fun thing. One thing uh, Andy and I have been finding as we go through this this movie is, you know, seeing Thor and Loki especially have just grown so much. You know, they've changed so much. Loki has, I think kind of been on almost every ethical side of hero and villain <laughs> by this point. Thor has become like, you know, gone from so many different iterations that really going back to the source material is just great. So we're going to have um, Ashley and Andy and myself talking about all that in just one moment. We love talking about Marvel movies with each other, but we also love talking about them with you. That's right. We would love to uh, have you join the conversation. We right now have a growing group of Marvel fans that are talking about this movie, about previous movies, about other things going on in the MCU over in our Discord server. Discord is a great place for this sort of conversation. We love using Discord and we would love to have you come on over there and join us. Just head to truestory.fm slash Marvel Movie Minute and click on the Discord link. See you there. So let's dive right into this minute 11. Ashley, what was kind of the first thing that grabbed you as you watched this one minute? I feel like I didn't notice things in that room. Like when I came in, I was really watching everything and I saw little things in the room that I didn't see before. And it was just interesting to like, I don't know, come into watching one minute of something like, okay, I'm going to dissect every little bit of this. And it was a really good one. Like I really liked that minute. Mm -hmm. Well, should we open with the Einherjar guards walking through what we know is Thor's arsenal, where all these weapons are kept. Odin's and, arsenal. Oh, Odin's Od arsenal. Thank you. Or Odin's vault. Yeah. It was about to be Thor's. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. We're so close. <laughs> exactly. So true. And one of the first thing we see is the warlock's eye. Uh, Andy, what is that eye that we see? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> right. It, it's it's such a cool looking eye, like this giant yellow floating eye that seems to be watching the guards as they go by. That the warlock's eye was uh it was in the comics. It was a mystical weapon, uh a group called the Hurricane. They used it against Odin, Thor, and the Warriors Three uh when they invaded Asgard because they were trying to prevent Ragnarok. And um it's a mind controlling um, weapon that um, it's hard to resist, but obviously Odin was able to stop them with his uh, with son and the Warriors Three and everyone else. And here it sits. Nice. <laughs> and I don't know if this was a trick of the camera or just me kind of projecting, but I felt like the eye was moving a little bit as the action. Uh, oh, do other people see totally? That? It's yeah, so, the yeah. my note says, "What is that eye thing?" Ew, it moved. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so that was definitely a thing. And then I think we get this great scene of the the, the seeing just kind of the the frost giant's hand start to move in here. Because uh, I think in this, we talked before about how in the script the frost giants were coming in much earlier. But I like that we're just getting this very subtle like introduction to wait a minute, this is the bad thing that's happening now. Before we talk about the Frost Giants, I just have to point out something else that is very hard to see. But if you look <laughs> as we pass the Warlock's Eye, if you look through it across the room to the other nook, you can see it's out of focus. But it looks like there is actually a sword in that other room across the way. Hmm, okay. And and it's, mm. it's you know... I, I've never seen anybody been, who has actually pointed that out as far as what it could potentially be, but 
I know that technically there have been a few different swords that have been stored in Odin's vault from time to time. And it's entirely possible this could be the space traveling sword, which is also mm-hmm. Baldur's sword. And um, it was um, Thor. I think he needed this in the comics. He needed medicine to save Jane. And this sword transported it uh, from Asgard all the way to uh, to Midgard. And so, mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't know. It's It's possible it's that there's also... Odin's sword, which uh, sits in the uh, the vault from time to time. Although I think we may see that in a later minute, so we'll talk about that another time. But mm-hmm. I have to point that out because if you look real carefully, you can see it across That's the way. Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But anyway, back to the frost giants. <laughs> yeah, well, I think this, this is the first time I think that we ever see that the frost giants can literally not just they can make weapons out of ice, but just that whole like their presence means that things are freezing around them. You know, just that they carry this aura of frost around everything they do which I thought was a great little just cinematic moment. It's an interesting, uh, I don't know, uh, power, I guess we'd say, that that they have. And I, I, it'll be interesting to see over the course of the film what other things that we see that they're able to do with the power of ice, right? I mean, obviously they can't do what the Casket of Ancient Winters does, which is like, you know, blasting a giant uh, thing of ice at everything in front of it and freezing all of it, but they can just touch something and turn it to ice. So that's that certainly is an interesting Thing that we see here. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And here we're kind of drawing both on, I'm sure it comes up in the comic books, but you think about the mythology, you know, in Scandinavia, if there's anything that's going to be terrifying, it's frost and ice spreading when you're not ready for it and things like that. And that's, so these being like the creatures of evil and myth, you know, makes a lot of sense in, in, in the mythology that all these stories are coming from. Yeah. So, and, and speaking of that, I know We've had now a couple of shots of the ravens that are so essential to Odin in the mythology, in the in the comic books, uh, in this movie as well. Andy, talk a bit about what what we're seeing when we see those two ravens with with Odin once we sort of get, go back to the coronation moment. I, I'd like to say that they were featured more prominently than they are, and they have actually been in the throne room, sitting on the arms of of Odin's throne since we saw it way back in minute eight. We just hadn't mentioned them yet, but his Odin or his ravens are there. They are, uh, I, I'm not sure it's Hugin or Huggin <laughs> and, and Moonin. Those are his two ravens. Their, their names mean thought and memory. And in the myths, they fly all over Midgard. Uh, they bring information to Odin and that's kind of what they would do in the comics. They, they do a lot more for him and stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's it's fun to see them here. I, I know some people complained that there weren't enough of the ravens in the movies, but it is at least nice to see that they see do it. have them here. Mm-hmm. Were they alive? Yeah, they're sitting on the, if you look oh at his God. throne, they're sitting up at the top corners of it, just it sitting just there. It just shows, I couldn't stop staring at Chris Hemsworth's eyebrows. <laughs> I was like, my God, what did they do? I, I was know. very distracted. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hairstylist and I was just like, ugh. Well, you know, that, that that's the segue I was looking for because, uh, Ashley, you have so many great things you contribute. I know you're actually doing a whole thing also on Twitch that we'll talk about later on mythology, and I want your thoughts on that. Uh, you're also our resident thirst queen on the uh, MCU podcast. We'll get into all the thoughts about Hemsworth and Loki. But as a person, I love listening to you on the MCU podcast because you point out so much about wigs and makeup and, and that whole part of filmmaking at least, I, Andy, I don't know about you, but I know nothing about. So what is happening with Thor's eyebrows? I, it's like <laughs> Thor's wig, like, it may be bad, but the real, like, razzy of it was his eyebrows. Like, woof. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what they were thinking. Like, Chris Hemsworth, he already looks like Thor. So without the flair, like, no flair needed makeup artist. Just, like, put the brushes down. You're making things worse. He already looks like it. Like, despite everything I just said, he's still, like, the hottest guy I've ever seen. <laughs> but uh, like even with the eyebrows, like he's unnaturally good looking. Um, so they didn't need to do anything. But I think they were just really going for like comic look. Yeah. And I guess I'll let them get away with it. But like I liked how they transitioned him out as the movies went on. Like it was very slow. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad they transitioned him. It, it, yeah. It's so distracting to see him like this. And I know that Kevin Feige at some point said, you know, when somebody asked him if he had anything that he wished that he could change. I can't remember when he said this, at what point. It was probably around, like, Infinity War. But is there anything that he wished he could change with all of the films in the MCU? And he said, I only have one regret, and that we bleached Chris Hemsworth eyebrow- eyebrows in the first <laughs> <It's> Thor <laughs> movie. <laughs> They're yeah, so terrible. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm so glad you could point that out, because, like, I've probably now seen Ragnarok four or five times. I've seen Infinity War and Endgame a bunch of times. I hadn't seen the first Thor movie, like, 
until I went back and rewatched it for this. I think I saw it two or three times a long time ago. And Thor just looked so weird and I couldn't put my finger on it. And it's, it's the eyebrows. That's, that's, <laughs> it's, it's shocking. You're like, yeah. uh. Uh huh. And is this uh, the only movie that happened? Do they at least fix it by Dark World or is it not to like Ragnarok or Avengers? No, they- in Dark World, he has like the best hair and makeup. Like they, the yeah. only thing they cared about in that movie was costume <laughs> and makeup. Um, they saved a lot of money with a script writer. That's for certain. Yeah. So <laughs> they, everybody in that movie looked fantastic. Um, even in, uh, Avengers, they got rid of the eyebrows, but he still has pretty much the same wig because it's not supposed to be too much longer after that, I don't think. Okay. Uh, So they kept his hair length just a little bit longer, Mm -hmm. but the eyebrows, gone. (laughs) Okay. That's good. Well, we'll definitely kind of keep an eye on that as we go on. Uh, No pun intended there. (laughs) So, and then we get into Thor taking the oath. And I think, Andy, you were the one who pointed out Odin doesn't like this is such a monumental moment for the Asgardians. And, you know, I'm a pastor. When I do a wedding and we kind of talked about this is kind of a wedding, I often give the like, you know, welcome, everybody. We're here for this joyous occasion. You know, marriage. Marriage is what brings us together. (laughs) Odin does none of that. He just goes right into do you swear? Uh, And I know there was a longer speech in the script. What actually for you, what did it? What did, what did you kind of get out of it, of Odin just kind of going right into this moment without any... He doesn't seem to care about all the chutzpah and stuff that's going on. I don't know. To me, he seemed a little bitter. You know, like, like I don't know. He's like, he's not really maybe ready. Like, he knows that Thor's not really ready, but the pomp and circumstance kind of has to happen because he really just doesn't care. He's just like, are you ready? da 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 monotone. And I'm like, uh, Thor doesn't care, though. He's super happy. <laughs> Well, and, and you missed it in the last minute because it, it seems like he's starting to cry or something like And it, so it's kind of an odd thing. And, and then in the in the scene that didn't get shot, that was in the script, it, it starts with him talking about how he's kind of ill and mm. uh, he needs the all sleep so that he can kind of heal himself. And so that's kind of why he's pushing for this coronation right here. But still, it just seems the way that it, he approaches it is so abrupt here and just like for all these people like they walk in he strikes his staff and it's basically it it reminds me of like just a vegas wedding or something it's like do you want to be king all right you're king yeah. it's like it's just... <laughs> yeah i think that makes sense and i think it's i do kind of wish we'd gotten more of the stuff we do see in deleted scenes or in the script about how odin is fading he's aging and he's not doing as well because you know, when you think we know that these they're not immortal, but that that's sort of the perception you have. You know, I, I, we talked in the last minute, uh, Ashley, about how Zeus would never do this with Apollo or Hermes. Like Zeus is just going to be Zeus forever. And yeah, right. I, I do like that interpretation you mentioned of that. Maybe Odin is he's not thrilled about having to give up this power and having to yeah. to recognize that he is fading and he can't mm-hmm. do this anymore. And so we get the oath, you know, it's to, will you swear to guard the nine realms, to preserve the peace, to cast aside all selfish ambition and pledge yourself only to the good of the realm. Uh, that last part especially seems very pointed to what we've known about Thor up to this moment. <laughs> do, do you think that's just kind of the, that's what's written in their book of common prayer? Or is Odin kind of shaping this a little to kind of poke Thor and be like, remember, this is what you're signing up for. You can't just be the brash kid anymore. There feels a little bit like it's meant to be pointed, but it it does make me wonder if it is just kind of the standard thing that they say, because I feel like Thor is not actually listening to anything. And I feel like if if Odin was doing some unique original speech that were, you know, a, a series of questions that were specifically designed for Thor, I feel like maybe Thor would listen a little bit more, but... I I don't know. It just feels like this is something that they've all heard before, although I don't know when they would have heard any (laughs) of this. Uh, But still, it's just like Thor doesn't seem like he's paying attention at all. And I think it's so funny when that last question that Odin Odin asks him, do you swear to cast aside all selfish ambition and pledge yourself only to the good of all, all the realms? One, Loki has a great look at Thor like, oh, let's see what you're going to do here. And then Thor, like, he just, like, it's the cockiest thing. Like, he raises his hand in the air and he's like, I swear. And he's like, you know, this all-powerful guy. <laughs> and it's just like, God, he is just, he's not hearing any of this. Like, I don't uh-huh. feel like he just heard the words that came out of Odin's mouth. No. <laughs> Frigga wrote down, like, all you have to do is say, I swear after everything, you're going to be fine. I love you. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's interesting in the script, it, there's actually, 
the word beat between Odin's question and Thor. And generally, that's, you know, a pause for the actors to kind of like take a moment before they do their line. And it's interesting that that's in there because, I mean, we don't have a beat at all. But by putting that in there, it does make it feel like Thor actually did think about that before he mm-hmm. said it. So it's interesting mm-hmm. that uh, Kenneth Branagh, when he uh, and his editor decided to cut it together, they said, you know what, let's make it let's make him as arrogant as we can here. Right. I mean, I think isn't that where he like raises up the axe, the, the hammer while he says, I swear, mm-hmm. you yeah, know, he's just right. so yeah. into it. And we were talking before about how frustrating this was that Odin never says what he declares. We never know, like, is he about to actually make Thor king? Is he to say, Thor, you're now officially the heir? But of course, he gets interrupted when it's like, oh, frost giants. But even before that, I felt like Odin hesitates for a moment. Do you think he's just, is he just drawing out the drama? Or do you think on some level he's still like, all right, I guess we have to do this? Yeah. He definitely seems a little apprehensive about the whole situation. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, we talked about how he kind of is a bad parent anyway. And (laughs) I can't I can't help but feel he's also taunting Thor. Mm. Oh, that's That's interesting. That's true. Kind of like pokey, just like he wants to kind of test Thor's humility. Like, can you take this? And everyone's just trying to ruin his special day. Exactly. I, I, I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> I, I will say in the script, it. I, I don't know. I, I feel like the script makes it clear that he's giving him the throne. Like he, it is an actual coronation, not just mm-hmm. a declaration of you are my heir sort of thing. Um, right. But again, right. he still never says anything. He gets to the mm-hmm. point where he says, then on this day, I, Odin, all father, proclaim you. And so same thing in the script. You don't get mm-hmm. any actual thing out of his mouth telling us what what's actually happening here. And so then, of course, Odin stops it because he says, you know, oh, frost giants. I thought this is something interesting. In the script, what we see is that that frost that happens when the frost giants are near starts to come everywhere. You know, it says that like the the pennants and flags that are waving start to freeze. But we wind up seeing none of that. We just get the sense of Odin just kind of like knows that it's happening, especially because his guard is about to be in danger. I I feel like I actually like this version a lot more. What What did you all think of... Odin sort of having no reason to think it. He just like knows on some level. I, I, I don't know. I'm torn with the way that it's depicted. I think it's interesting uh, that it makes it feel like by not seeing the, the frost forming on the banners and Odin and everybody starts noticing the ice, which clues them in, it makes it seem like Odin just has a sense of danger in his in his in his land in mm-hmm. Asgard in the palace but at the same time i can't help but wonder why did it take him until the moment when uh when the frost giants are about to attack for him to notice that like why didn't he feel this sense when they first actually entered Asgard and so to that end i was like well i like that it seems like he's sensing it but why is it take until that particular moment for him to realize it maybe maybe he just wanted the ceremony to be over so when he heard a noise he was like frost giant this thing is off (laughs) looking for any excuse for sure (laughs) and then he was like oh no it's really well uh oh it's true Uh uh-huh yeah (laughs) And, and so we cut back and forth a bit here and we get this great scene of the the reflection in the ice which i really liked of the the einherjar guard looking down and then seeing the 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 frost giant behind them um and Andy, I think there are a couple of things you wanted to point out in terms of like who who the actor is here and, and some of what we notice in these shots. It's, you know, it's really hard to tell who. Uh, well, first of all, the Frost Giants are almost impossible to ever tell which actor is playing them because they have so much makeup on. And unless they're very clearly pointed out, like Lofi is played by Colm Fjord, I just don't know. Um, the Ein Harriar guards, they're a little easier because you can see their face um, sometimes, although the the helmets, the massive helmets can hide them. It's kind of hard to tell uh, who these two, maybe three people are, but I think we have Stephen O. Young playing the one who actually spots the little pool of water there um, freezing, and then he's the one who first gets kind of throttled by one. And then the second one, and he's the one who gets hit by the ice sword. I couldn't tell if it's Adam Critchlow or Matthew, Matthew Ducey, but uh, they're both credited as Ein Harrier guards, so... It could be any of those that are that are here. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, I will we'll always try to point out the actors when they're clearly identifiable. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are times where it's pretty hard to tell. Yeah, that's especially a tough when, scene. Yeah, especially when, yeah, when the camera is moving as fast as it is and, and everything. It's, it's pretty tough. 
Right. Well, and even there, we get this scene of it, it almost looks like we're sort of a small person running in between the legs of the two frost giants. And I, I just love that shot of the frost giants running towards the casket to grab it because it, it, it continues the same thing we saw in the battle a couple minutes ago. It's so frenetic. It's so it, it's not just like, oh, we're sitting back watching everything. We get the sense of the chaos that's happening. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, I do have to point out it's it's one of those funny things that when we first see that the frost giants are here, they're kind of in I don't even know like a space behind where the relics are stored because we see that they're that first hand freezing the wall behind the warlock's eye and that means that they have to somehow squeeze out from between the wall and the <laughs> warlock's eye and I'm like is is there room for a giant to get through there <laughs> it's so true <laughs> I, I have a hard time picturing that I mean obviously three of them figured out how to do it but I, I would think that they would at least knock something over in the process but yeah, they're um, so big <laughs> <laughs> right I, I mean it's also funny because I feel like by the later movies, it becomes very important that every single detail be explained so perfectly. I don't think we're there yet in the MCU. You know, like, <laughs> as we later find out, the Bifrost is how you get in and out. Yeah. But Loki found a secret passage. A couple. Of- Do we know anything about how that interacts with the Bifrost or the Jotunheim or any? Nah, we don't need any of that. We just, you know, it's just what happened. And I think I think with, with some of these shots... I don't I think there may have been some level of and I don't again, because like I think we forget how different things were just even 10 years ago. People weren't always doing the shot by shot analysis. I think there's sometimes a feeling with someone like Branagh of, OK, we're going to we don't need to actually figure out exactly every detail because people are just going to be like so taken up in the moment that they're not going to notice. Yeah. Like, wait, where did they actually come from in that in that moment? Yeah, it wasn't yeah. ready for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But I mean, to your point, that is actually an interesting thing that I mean, we will explore over the course of this, because obviously Loki did figure out a way to sneak things in that wasn't through the Bifrost. So Heimdall wouldn't see them. Um, And even earlier, when we were talking about um, uh, Tonesburg, the fact that the Frost Giants somehow all transported themselves to Midgard, but they weren't on the Bifrost. So how did they get there? Like, so there are ways to travel (laughs) that uh, I I think it's going to be um, a lot of questions that likely will never be answered, but, um, but obviously there are ways. Definitely. Definitely. Well, well, so from what we can tell now, the frost giants have the casket. They're going to get away clean. Everything is just fine for them in this little heist movie we got here. (laughs) Um, This, the next minute we talk about might change that a bit, but um, Ashley, for but uh, let me start with you, Ashley. Any other kind of last things you noticed about this minute before we wrap up and go to the next one? I I really was enjoying seeing everybody all young. Mm-hmm. They're all so young. It made me feel young. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Hemsworth doesn't so, seem like he's aimed that aged that much, but Hiddleston looks like such a baby in these scenes. Such a baby, a little emo baby. Yeah. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I enjoy like I. Knowing what we know now and watching him do the acting, like it all just goes together so well. Like the character hasn't really changed. You can see even from the first episode, he's a little bit of an agent of chaos. Yeah. Just enjoying everything that's kind of happening, even though we don't know it yet. It's written all over his face. Yeah, definitely. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, Annie, what about yourself? I think there was especially a shot uh, when Thor was lined up with Odin you wanted to point out. Yeah, just one last little um just the way that they constructed a particular shot when Thor was um, going through his oath after Odin asks him the first question, it cuts to a shot of Thor. And uh, it's just interesting the way that he was framed, that Brana and uh, Harris uh, Zambarlikas, the cinematographer, chose to frame it where Thor is on the right side of the frame and he's looking off to the right. And then you have the line of on Harriar honor guard kind of moving off to the left but by having the character on the right looking right uh, normally you would have the character if they're going to be looking off screen right the character would be on the left so you have that space between Mm -hmm. their eyes and the edge of frame it just makes for a more comfortable image and by putting him on the right and looking to the right it creates this sense of imbalance which kind of creates this tension and audiences and and people may not actually know that's what's happening, but they might feel that something just feels off. And it could be because we have frost giants. We know that there are frost giants. Something's happening mm-hmm. down in the in the vault. It also could be that, you know, it's I mean, it's interesting that it's happening during the oath. And it could be something just is off with the fact that Thor doesn't necessarily 
you know, believe everything he's saying here in this particular oath. So it's an oh, interesting. Sir Kenneth. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank it's... you, Sir Kenneth, and your stage. He brings so much to his directing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really true. It's really true. All right. Well, uh, thank you both so much. Uh, Annie, thank you so much for uh, help, help, helping me kind of keep this on track with all the great information. <laughs> Ashley, Absolutely. for our listeners who are hearing you for the first time, where can they find more about you and all the great stuff you're doing? Uh, you can find me on the MCU cast at strandedpanda.com or on iTunes, everything as the Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. And we do trivia on Twitch Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern uh, Marvel trivia at Stranded Panda slash TV something. Yeah, yeah it's It'll on be in the show. Twitch .com, <laughs> strand, you go to twitch.com Stranded Panda TV. You'll find it. So thanks, Ashley, Boo. thanks so much. This has been great. Can't wait to have you on for the, uh, every other day this week. Andy, as always, thank you. To all of our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Come back tomorrow and have a great day. Until next time, true believers. Bye. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is One Last Ride by Martin Puringer. Find the show at truestory.fm. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. 